traveling abroad with your children and worried about diseases like Zika virus and malaria, on today's episode, we're going to talk all about mosquito-borne illness prevention while traveling abroad. So let's jump in. Welcome to the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. As a pediatrician and mother herself, Dr. Rolnick is here to answer your most pressing parenting questions and guide you through the tough spots. Welcome back to Be Kind Pediatrics. For those of you who are new to the show, my name is Dr. Blair Rolnick. I'm a board certified pediatrician and mom myself. On last week's episode, I had mentioned that summer is coming and I've had a few families come into clinic asking about pre-vacation travel medicine questions. And so we discussed a little bit about um, the conversations I have with them regarding food safety and vaccine safety. On today's episode, we are going to focus more on um, tick-borne and mosquito-borne illness um, and prevention strategies for those. So I'm going to start right off the bat about talking about specifically malaria. So again, you want to check out the CDC and the WHO websites to see if the area that you're traveling to is an area that is endemic with malaria. And it's a special consideration for pediatric patients because children under five are really the highest risk for severe malaria. Um, and you often need to start your malaria prophylaxis actually prior to your trip. So prior to your departure date. So again, this is um, if you're traveling to an area where malaria is a concern, this is an appointment you want to make with your pediatrician or travel medicine doctor several weeks before your departure date. So what happens if your child is under five or you're traveling to an area where maybe malaria is an endemic, but there are other mosquito-borne illnesses like Zika virus? So in that case, you really want to focus on preventing mosquito bites um, up front, and there are several strategies for doing so. We'll save the discussion for um, insect repellents for last, and let's just talk about some of the physical barriers that can help reduce um, bug bites while abroad. One is if you're sleeping in a place where there are really endemic mosquito-borne illnesses, you want to consider having a mosquito net around your baby when you're outside at night, um, also when they are sleeping at night. So breathable mesh net that either goes over their bassinet or crib and then over their stroller when you're out during the day. For older children, you do also want to consider the mosquito net while they're sleeping, as well as appropriate clothes for both older and younger children and babies. So trying to cover up as much of their exposed skin as appropriate. Um, if you're going somewhere hot, that might not be a realistic expectation. But again, trying to cover their arms and legs as much as possible. Also consider the use of the fan, especially for infants. A nice travel fan on the stroller can be a great option for keeping mosquitoes away. When eating outside, especially during the nighttime, considering going to restaurants that use fans, again, to keep mosquitoes away. You also want to try to avoid areas that mosquitoes particularly like to hang out in. Those are going to be areas where there is stagnant water because that's where they lay their eggs and continue their life cycle. Garbage cans, etc. You also want to take a think about what you're wearing. So um, bright colors, especially floral patterns, actually tend to attract mosquitoes and bugs. So trying to um, take into consideration maybe wearing something a little bit less bright as well as think about what you're putting on your skin. So interestingly, actually, a lot of mosquitoes and bugs are attracted to scents. So avoiding highly scented soaps, perfumes, hairsprays, et cetera, both on yourself and your children um, can help reduce the risk of mosquito bites. And then lastly, to kind of go along with the um, mosquito net at night, if you have windows, making sure they have a screen if they're open or preferentially keeping them closed so that you don't allow mosquitoes to come into your room. So now let's focus a lot on insect repellent and really take a deep dive into that. So I want to start up front by saying that the EPA makes a really nice website that help that can help you search and narrow down what insect repellent might be the best choice for you and your family. And I'll include that in the show notes. So what is the EPA anyway? The Center for Disease Control, the CDC, and the American Academy of Pediatrics both recommend that when you're choosing an insect repellent, that it has been registered with the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency. And I want to start by talking about DEET containing insect repellents because that is the most popular choice for most families. So right off the bat, as a pediatrician, um, I want to focus on those younger kids. So DEET is really not recommended for children under two months um, and should really be used sparingly on children um, two years and under. 
So you want to use the least amount necessary, the least concentration necessary for your trip outside, and the least amount of surface area as needed. DEET and insect repellent generally should be applied to exposed skin, not directly to clothing. So again, you can minimize that exposure by wearing longer clothes that are more protective. So again, minimizing the amount of DEET that you need for the amount of time that you're going to be outside. So the DEET concentration correlates to the amount of time that it kind of lasts. So 10% concentration of DEET will last two hours versus 30% concentration of DEET will last five hours. Once you get to 50% concentration of DEET, you're not getting any extra hour of protection. So really no one should be applying more than 50% DEET. So another option, some families might choose Picardin, which is similar to DEET and that the stronger the concentration, the longer it lasts. So about 5% is good for about three to four hours versus 20% is good for about eight to 12 hours. So you wanna again, choose the smallest concentration necessary for the amount of time that you're gonna be outside. And the last option I wanna talk about is oil, lemon of eucalyptus. Um, this really should not be used for children under the age of three. Um, and again, the concentration is similar. So the higher concentrations last longer, but you wanna use the minimum concentration necessary. So eight to 10% is good for about two hours um, versus 30 to 40% is good for about six hours. One thing that all families should be aware of when using um, insect repellents is that there's always the potential for a local allergic reaction. Um, so if your child's skin is irritated after applying this, you should immediately wash it with warm soap and water and contact your pediatrician. So I usually do recommend that you do a small trial on a little bit of skin prior to leaving, um, especially if you're traveling internationally so that you have your doctor available to you. Um, if your doctor is unavailable, you can also always call Poison Control. They are a great resource for all things um, biochemical. Their number is 1-800-222-1222. And now let's kind of just talk about some do's and don'ts of insect repellent. So the first do is to choose things that are creams and lotions. Don't choose things that are aerosolized. Generally, aerosolized insect repellents have a higher risk for getting in your child's eyes and mouth and for them to inhale it um, into their lungs. So again, opt for lotion or cream-based insect repellents, even though they might be a little bit more laborious in their application. They're generally considered safer. When you're applying insect repellent, you wanna apply it to your child's skin and maybe to the outside of their clothing, but never apply it to clothing, um, to skin where clothing is going on top of. So for example, you don't wanna apply insect repellent all over their belly and then put a t-shirt over it. And again, the same principle applies here, less is more. So more insect repellent doesn't mean it is more effective. You wanna use the minimum amount and the minimum concentration needed for your travel needs. You do want to apply it outside or where there's good ventilation. Again, so you don't inhale, um, accidentally inhale the insect repellent and that your child doesn't accidentally inhale it as well. You do want to, when you're applying it to the face, make sure that you're staying clear of the eyes, nose, and mouth area. Do, when you're done for the day and you're coming inside, immediately wash your child with warm soap and water to get rid of the excess insect repellents and wash any clothes that might, it might have got on. And then safe storage, you wanna keep these objects out of reach of your young children so to avoid them accidentally um, ingesting it. If your child does accidentally ingest insect repellent, this is one where I absolutely do recommend um, contacting your doctor and local poison control at 1-800-222-1222. So now that we've gone over all the do's with insect repellent, now let's cover all the do nots. Um, so again, the number one do not is to do not use aerosolized insect repellent. It is very, it has much more risk for inhalation injury from it. So opt for the creams and lotions. Do not apply insect repellent inside or where there is not good ventilation. Again, this increased the risk of aspirating the insect repellent. So also do not put insect repellents on your young child or infant's hands. We all know how infants especially love to put their hands in their mouth all day, um, and we do not want them to accidentally ingest the insect repellent. Also, do not, again, put insect repellent um, spray on your child's face. Instead, opt for a little dab of cream and lotion, put it on your hands first, and then apply it to their face 
avoiding their eyes, nose, and mouth. Do not apply insect repellent over open cuts or wounds. It can be highly irritating. And again, we don't want any absorption into those cuts or wounds. And lastly, do not put on um, sunscreen on top of insect repellent. This is one that's not so intuitive, um, but sunscreen actually needs to be reapply, applied every couple hours. Um, and applying this product over insect repellent can actually expose you to too much insect repellent. So one or the other preferentially. In the last couple minutes, I wanna spend talking a little bit about ticks and tick-borne illness prevention. So for this, it's actually not just specific to international travel because we actually have endemic tick-borne illnesses here in New Jersey, um, but I wanna include it in our section on um, insect repellents because for tick-borne um, diseases, the best thing to do is to per, um, apply permethrin. And opposite to insect repellent, you actually wanna apply um, permethrin to your clothing and gear, you know, sleeping bags, tents, shirts, socks, and not on your skin, as opposed to insect repellent that gets applied to the skin and really not so much on the clothing and certainly not on skin underneath the clothing. And then the same basic principles apply. You wanna actually protect your skin as much as possible, wearing long sleeves, um, long pants, socks that go up and over your pants to protect your ankles. Um, when you come in from outside, you wanna wash those clothes immediately um, and check your child for any ticks, especially the hair um, behind the ears um, and the feet. Ticks that transmit specifically Lyme, though Lyme is not the only tick-borne illness, um, are usually nymphal ticks, which are actually very, very tiny, smaller than um, a sesame seed. And so it can be often very hard to see, but they do need to be attached for at least 24 hours to, to transmit Lyme disease. Um, and so you do want to check yourself when you're coming in, because if you find a tick um, and it, you remove it immediately, the risk of transmission of Lyme is very, very low. All right, so that kind of wraps up our discussion today for travel medicine, specifically focusing on prevention of tick and mosquito-borne illnesses. Again, I hope you guys all have some super fun family vacation plans for this summer, um, and I hope that this episode helps you do it more safely. Thank you for watching the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. For more episodes and her practice, visit BeKindPediatrics.com, and don't forget to subscribe for more parenting tips wherever you get your podcasts. This information is for educational purposes only. It is not medical advice. Always seek medical advice from a qualified physician.